It's a somber reminder of why we celebrate Memorial Day. Um, you know, I know that most of us, it's like a day off, and let's have a picnic, and cook out, and all of those good things. And that, there's nothing wrong with enjoying that with family and friends. But we need to remember the real reason of why we celebrate Memorial Day. It's a memorial to those who have given their life for you, for me, for this country. We are free because men and women fight for us. So let's just pray over those families right now, um, all of them that are involved in the military service. Father, we just come to you and we thank you. There's not many people that would be willing to die for another person. Your son Jesus did that for us. But Lord, there are men and women across this world that have given their life and are serving now, Lord, for us to keep us and our country free. And I pray that you would minister to them, that you would provide safety and protection over them. Lord, I pray for their families that they're separated from. Father, that you would give them peace and comfort. Let them know how much not only you love them, but how much we as a people in this country also are so grateful and love them, Lord. So I just pray that you send your Holy Spirit now to minister to minister in a powerful way. Lord, we're so grateful for this country that we live in. We're so privileged and so blessed, Lord, and we just thank you. Let us not take it for granted and always remember. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. If you have your Bibles or your devices, go ahead and turn to 2 Thessalonians. Excuse me, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It is already the end of May, last Sunday in May. It's crazy how fast, I say this every week, how fast our year is going. And this month, although we've had Mother's Day in the middle of it all, I kind of wavered from our message during that week. But I've been preaching a message called Heaven's Hope. Heaven's Hope. And last week, we talked about the, the promise of the Holy Spirit. It was Pentecost Sunday. That is part of heaven's hope. You know, when we look at heaven, we have a hope. We have a hope and a future. This isn't it. <laughs> yes, thank you, Lord, this isn't it. We have a blessed hope of spending eternity with our Lord and our Savior. And, um, and so we've talked about the promise of the Holy Spirit. The first message was just about what's happening in our world. No one seems to want to talk about it. There's crazy stuff going on in our world. What's happening? And when we look at it from a worldly perspective, it doesn't make sense at all, the craziness. But when we look at it from a biblical perspective, we understand that it's all been prophesied and told ahead of time that these things would happen and that it's all leading up to Jesus' return, right? Whether we want to acknowledge that or not, it's the truth. And so today's title, I want to end this month by, um, by answering a question of what do we do in the meantime? While we're waiting on Jesus, what do we do as believers, while we wait on the Lord to return and to rescue us or rapture us, not just us, but the church. In other words, what are we going to do in the meantime while we're waiting? How many of you have a hard time waiting? <laughs> Probably every hand should go up. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you wanted to know, how many of you have a hard time waiting? She didn't hear my question. <laughs> Maybe your spouse or your friend or your significant other is taking forever to get ready, and you're famished, and you want to go get something to eat. You want to get your favorite meal, and you're thinking, what is taking them so long? Can we just go already? Or maybe you've been walking through a really difficult season. Maybe you've had some health issues or some financial setbacks or some relationship upheavals. Maybe you've suffered some debilitating loss. 
and you've reached out to God and you've prayed and you've cried and you've pleaded and you've offered plea deals and all you've heard is crickets. <laughs> no angelic choir. <laughs> no deep godly voice. No miraculous signs. Not even a tinkling of a bell. I don't, you have to be old enough to understand that one. Where is God supposed to be? Where is he? He's supposed to see everything. He's supposed to hear everything. He's supposed to care about every detail of our life. And you're thinking, where is he? You're tired of waiting. Sure, other good intention people come along and, and they quote scriptures to you and they tell you that they're praying for you. And they tell you and encourage you to wait on the Lord because the answer's coming. <laughs> but you just want God to step out of heaven and come into this earthly realm and solve all your problems, answer all your prayer requests in an instant. Like right now you want him to do it, like this minute. <laughs> then your life can go back to normal and everything would be good, right? That's how we think. How many of you felt that way? How many of you feel that way right now? <laughs> Jackie just keeps raising her hand. Well, patience and long-suffering are two traits that none of us are born with. Patience and long-suffering. You can look at a newborn baby. If you've ever had one or you've been around one, they come into the world screaming <laughs> and continue that behavior for about 18 years. <laughs> they have no patience whatsoever. I tell everybody that our son Taylor, he's not here, so don't tell him I told you so, that our son Taylor came into the world giving instructions to everybody, demanding, get me a bottle, get me a diaper. Get me. He was just so demanding when he was born, well, most of his life. He's wonderful now. I can't say that now, but... Babies, they just don't have any patience. They're hungry. They're dirty. They're inconvenienced. They're bored. They're tired. They're unhappy. Not just babies, all the way up to 18, right? And they want you to fix it. And they want you to fix it right now. <laughs> Never will you hear a child say, oh, I know you're busy right now. I'll wait for you to finish what you're doing, and then you can help me. <laughs> Never do we hear a child say that. Sometimes we don't even hear other adults say that. <laughs> Here's the crazy thing. We never seem to grow out of that impatient behavior and attitude. We just don't. We're a fast-paced society, microwave society, we say. So as we're waiting for the Lord to return and gather us up and take us home with him, what should we do in the meantime? Instead of getting impatient and saying, Lord, I want you here. I want you doing this. I want you to come back. I want you to solve my problems. What should we be doing? Instead of griping and complaining, we should be doing something in the meantime. How do we wait patiently? How do we continue to navigate through this treacherous and painful world? How do we keep our mind and our heart and our life focused on the Lord? What do we do in the meantime? Well, I want to read 2 Thessalonians 2.15 to you. It's on the screen. And we're going to see what Paul had to say about this says 15 with all these things in mind dear brothers and sisters stand firm and keep a strong grip on the teaching we passed on to you both in person and by letter let's pray father thank you for your word i thank you for your word through your servant paul he has such 
powerful examples and instructions for us. And I pray, Lord, that we take this little bit of word today that we read and decipher for ourselves, Lord. And I pray that you would help us just to understand and get a new perspective, not only in here while we're hearing it, but out there when we need to take it and apply it to our life. So, Lord, move in a powerful way. I pray that you would convict hearts and lives, and I pray that your anointing would be strong and fresh and powerful in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you go back in this chapter, chapter 2, um, you will gain a greater understanding of why Paul says in verse 15, with all these things in mind. What does he mean by with all these things in mind, brothers and sisters? And so let me give you, instead of reading the whole chapter, I just want to give you a little bit of a highlight of what Paul said earlier in chapter 2. Well, he makes, the, he was describing earlier in chapter 2 of what the world would be like leading up to and during when the Antichrist steps onto the scene. Okay, most people, they gloss over this. They don't, they really don't want to read it. But here he is 2,000 years, over 2,000 years ago. He's writing of what life, what the world would look like in the end times. Leading up to when the Antichrist comes on the scene. And in some of those verses, he, he tells us that there's going to be a great rebellion against God in verse 3. Right? We see that now, a great rebellion. He says that a man of lawlessness or a man of sin would be revealed. And we know that that's going to be the Antichrist. He also says that this Antichrist will bring destruction upon the earth. He says that this Antichrist will exalt himself and defy everything that's godly. Everything that's godly. He also says that this, this man, this Antichrist, will, set, will sit in the temple of God proclaiming that he himself is God. And he says that the lawlessness or the sinfulness or the Antichrist spirit would already be secretly at work behind the scenes. You understand that the Antichrist spirit has already been secretly at work behind the scenes for years and years and years because that's how Satan works. He's sneaky. And he devises schemes. And we don't even know about it. You know, most of us are... I don't know. I'll talk for me. I'm always so surprised at the new things that have come out that seem illogical. And how can people believe this? How can they, how can they go along with this? Well, the enemy has been working. It didn't just happen all of a sudden. The enemy's been working behind the scenes for years and years and years. And now things are just coming to light and coming out. Paul also tells us that the Antichrist will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. Counterfeit. Everything Satan does is counterfeit. He tries to copy God, but it's counterfeit. And so when the Antichrist comes on the scene, the, this, this man will be able to do some powerful, miraculous things, but it's not from God. But people will be tricked. That he will use every kind of evil deception to fool people who are already deceived. And then the last thing I want to tell you that Paul said in these verses leading up to today's verse is good news. Because it says, but Jesus. I love that. But Jesus will slay him. Who? The Antichrist. With the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. I love that. Love that. That there is hope, right? We get depressed. We get downtrodden. We get, you know, feel defeated. Defeated. But we have to remember this verse. But Jesus. He makes everything right. So in other words, some crazy stuff will take place leading up to and after the Antichrist is revealed and comes on the scene. And I believe that we are in the leading up to stage, right? 
We're in the leading up to stage, and we're, but we're very, very close to the revealing stage. No one knows a day, a time, the hour when Jesus will return. No one knows when the Antichrist will, be, will come onto the scene and will be revealed. I believe he's here. He's ready. We just don't know who it is yet. You can't help but look around and see the craziness of our world, the illogical happenings, the turmoil, the fighting, the anti-Semitism, the disrespect, the natural disasters, and every other tumultuous thing taking place. That all of it is a prophetic precursor to the coming of the Lord and the emergence of the Antichrist. And I don't say all of this to scare you or to depress you or to remind you of the craziness that's taking place. I say it to prepare you and me. See, many people don't want to talk about it or think about it, but it's where we are, and it's something that needs to be discussed. You and I need to be aware so that we're prepared and so that we know what to do while we're waiting. In the meantime, right? So that we don't fall prey to the deception of the enemy and are fooled by his lies. Many, many people who call themselves Christians or believers have fallen prey to the lies of the enemy. And they've given in and they've compromised their beliefs. They've compromised the word of God. And I don't want you or me to be like that. The word of God is true. It never changes. God never changes. It never becomes um, invalid. If, if it's in here, it's true, and we live by it. It doesn't change. There are many that say, well, God didn't really mean what he said when he said this or that. No, that's a lie. They're being deceived. God meant it when he said it. Sin is sin. It doesn't change. It will always be sin. So what does Paul say that we should do in the meantime? Well, it's pretty simple. The first thing that he says that we should do is to stand firm. Stand firm. The original Greek word is steiko, and it's a verb. And what is a verb? Let's go back to school. It's an action word. That's right. <laughs> And so the, the meaning, the original meaning of stand firm means to stand fast, to persevere, or to persist, or to stay standing. In other words, we're not supposed to give up. We're not supposed to give in. We're not supposed to quit trying. We're not supposed to compromise in our beliefs or actions or sit down on the job. We're to stand firm. Now, I went back to my childhood as I was writing this, and I thought, you know, about a game that sometimes we played. Maybe you played it, too. It was a game where you tried to push someone over, or someone tried to push you over. <laughs> have you ever? Uh, maybe we were just weird ones. We, we, we didn't have much to play with growing up, you know, rocks and sticks and <laughs> freeze tag and yeah you know when you don't have toys and things like that you just you make up games um and so you'd stand firm but okay so maybe if you've never played it think about it Th think you know what would you do if you had to play that game where somebody was going to try to push you over what would you do huh stand firm but what don't you you know i, I you kind of get your your best footing right i mean you're not going to just kind of be lazy if somebody's going to come. You're going you're gonna to stiffen up, and you're going to get some good footing. You're probably going to separate your feet because if they're together, you have more of a chance. And, and you, you prepare yourself, right? You stiffen up. You go into defense mode. <laughs> and that's the meaning of Paul's instructions to us to stand firm, to go into defense mode, to get your footing you know, set, stiffen up. So what should we be standing firm against? Think about that. What are we standing firm against? Anybody? I know it's not Wednesday night, but I like to hear feedback. Huh? 
evil and the devil. Yes, we're standing firm against the lies and the schemes of the enemy that are put before us to try to trick us into turning our backs on God or to minimize our faith or our witness to others. Right? You know, first you have to believe that there's an enemy. Some people don't believe in hell or Satan or that there's an, there is an enemy. We can't see him, but he's there. We can sense him. We can feel him. We can see his tricks, his schemes. We hear his lies. And so when you acknowledge there's an enemy, what are you going to do? Just ignore him? That's most people. I just don't want to talk about it. I don't want to think about him. It kind of freaks me out and scares me. No, if an enemy came into your house, what would you do? Shoot him. You'd fight back. You'd go into defense mode, right? So we have an enemy of our soul. We have to fight back. We have to go into defense mode. And and we do that in multiple ways. Prayer, fasting, uh, we rebuke him, we quote God's word. But right now we're talking about standing firm, right? We're going to stand and fight, not turn and run. Think about some of the current lies and schemes of the enemy that many believers and unbelievers are falling for. And I'm going to give you a list of things, but it's not exhaustive. These are just the things that came to my mind. The lies and the schemes that the enemy has put before us like no other time in history. Gender identity. And I'm not even going to dwell on them, but reproduction rights. Sexual freedom. Uh, Promoting biblical inaccuracies, blurred lines of moral and ethical behavior, self-centeredness among humans, social justice over biblical truth, disrespect for authority, that there's no supreme authority, that you yourself are God. These are just a few things that have really come to light and gained ground, gained traction in our country and around the world. And they're all lies of the enemy. And if you don't know who you are, who God created you to be, what his word says, then you're going to have a hard time standing firm against them. So how in the world are we supposed to do that? How in the world are we supposed to stand firm against all these things plus more? Well, standing firm requires action on your part, on my part. It means making a commitment to Christ, to his purpose and his will, and to eternity. You make a commitment that you want to spend eternity with the Lord, then you're going to live differently. It's not only a heart commitment, but it's a life commitment. We hear about give your heart to Jesus, and that's, yes, that's true. But you also have to give your life to him. They go hand in hand. Standing firm means there's no time to take a break. There's no time to quit. There's no time to relax your stance. I'd love to tell you that, you can, that we can all just breeze through life, but we're, we're living in a time in history where we, don't, we are not going to be able to just breeze through life. We have to stand firm. Standing firm <coughs> means being mature. <coughs> means being mature in our faith and in our walk with the Lord. Did you hear what I said? Standing firm is meaning you need to grow up and you need to become mature in the Lord. It doesn't happen immediately. That's okay. But we always need to be working on it, gaining ground, becoming, growing more in in the Lord, becoming more mature. Ephesians 4.14. You don't have to turn there. I think they'll put it up. Ephesians 4.14 says, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like truth. If you know what God's word says, 
you're not going to be tricked. If you're mature in the Lord, you're not going to be tricked and lured away by the enemy's lies. If you want to be one of the ones who will be found faithful when Jesus returns, then you must stand firm while you're waiting. Number two, that Paul tells us what we're supposed to do in in verse 15 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, keep a strong grip on the teaching we passed on to you. (laughs) Keep a strong grip on the teaching. Well, what does strong grip mean? It means a hold of, to take possession of. That's the original Greek meaning. Well, what are we supposed to be taking possession of? Once we stand firm, we're supposed to take possession of something. What's it, what are we supposed to be taking possession of? Say it louder. There's no? I mean, yeah, but what is he saying in this verse? Sorry. <laughs> take hold. Get, keep a strong grip on what? On the teaching. Where does his teaching come from? The Bible. Yes, you all get stars on your forehead before you leave today. God's teachings and his instructions. You see, back then, they didn't have the Bible like we have. They had parts of it, Old Testament. But back then, it was mostly verbal teaching that they were hearing from Paul and from the other apostles. They were writing it down at that time, but they didn't have a physical copy of the Bible like we have now. They had to go off memory. Could you imagine? (laughs) I can't imagine because my memory is not all that great. (laughs) But we have the Word of God for ourselves. Most of us probably have many copies and many translations in our home of the Word of God. And we even have the internet now. You can Google it. You don't even have to have a physical copy. We have everything at our fingertips. We don't have to go off of memory. But why aren't we reading it and digesting it for ourselves like we should? If you start a new class, say you're going to get inspired you go back to school like Chris did just graduated but if you're (laughs) with his master's but if you go back to school and you're and you're starting a class or maybe you get a new job what are some of the things that you expect on the first day of a new job or a new class training or like orientation right And what do they do in that training, in that orientation? Well, number one, they're going to train you to do the job you were hired to do. They're going to give you instructions, probably a manual of some sort. Or if you're in a class, they're going to give you a syllabus of what the class is going to be about for the next semester or however many weeks. Without either one of those, without a a training manual, without a syllabus, without training in in general, you're going to be set up for failure. How are you going to pass this class? How are you going to succeed in the job if somebody doesn't give you instruction? Somebody doesn't train you? Somebody doesn't give you guidelines? Well, when you give your life to Christ, you're presented with a book. And it's called the Bible. <laughs> it's God's written word. It's his instructions on how to live as his child. How to live as a follower of Jesus, a disciple. And in this book, it spells out everything for us. It tells you what what happened to you when you gave your heart to Jesus. It tells you how you became a new creation you know, in that you gain the mind of Christ. So it, it explains all of that, but it also tells you what to do next. It tells you how to live, where to go, what to do, what to say, what to think, how to pray. It gives you everything you need to set you up to be successful as a believer. Without reading it and applying it, you will most definitely fail. And the enemy knows it. 
every time, you know, when, when Jesus was gone for 40 days, fasting for 40 days, 40 nights, and the enemy came in, and everything the enemy tried to trick him with, what did, the, what did Jesus do? He quoted the word. He quoted scripture. If you want to be successful, if you don't want to fail, if you don't want to uh, be deceived by the enemy, then you need to know what this says for yourself. Not wait for a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night for the preacher or teacher to tell you about it. Hmm. So when Paul says, keep a strong grip on this teaching we passed on to you, he means a strong grip. He doesn't mean a passing glance or an occasional peek. (laughs) He means a strong grip. Take possession of. A strong grip means this thing should be with you always. All the time, always ready to be opened, read, studied, and digested. I just want to give you three, I'm almost done, three scriptures that talk about the Word of God. Psalms 119.105 says, Your Word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. If you don't know where you're going or what you should be doing, pick this up. Read it. (laughs) Not just pick it up, read it. It's a guide for your feet. It's a light for the next step that you need to take. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says all, say that word with me, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. If you want to be equipped to face this world, read the word. Apply the word. Let the word correct you. Don't be an unteachable person. There's many people that are unteachable. They don't want to hear what they're doing wrong because they do everything right. Well, let me tell you, that's a lie. No one does everything right. <laughs> no one. Let the word of God teach you. It's, it's powerful. It's convicting. And it's supposed to be. The last one, Hebrews 4.12, says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. A lot of people don't want to read the word because of this. You read it and it's going to expose who you are, what you're thinking, how you're acting, what you're feeling. And most people are like, ah, don't want to do that. I like my life. It's comfortable. I'm good. And the Lord is saying, that's not who I created you to be. I'm trying to mold you and make you into something that looks like him. And the molding process is painful. It's shaping you. It's knocking off the rough edges. It's hard to hear. It's hard to receive. But if we're going to stand strong, stand firm, we have to go through that process So these two simple truths and these instructions are the answer to our current problems of the world that we're facing while we wait on Jesus. We need to stand firm and we need to get a strong grip on God's word, on the instructions that have been given to us. So as the worship team comes back up, you know, for those who haven't been here, we always end our time singing, worshiping one more time. Because it's during this time that the Lord, the Holy Spirit, starts working on our heart. Hopefully he's been working on your heart the whole time that his word has been going out. That's what God does. He starts reminding us of things. He starts speaking things to us. He starts convicting us of maybe some behaviors or thoughts or patterns in our life that we need to change. 
And I know I went through a really long period of time where I didn't read God's word like I should. And why I didn't, I, I don't know. I was busy, four kids. I, you know, we all have excuses. You, you can fill in the excuses. I don't understand it. I, you know, there's a lot of excuses, but none of them are good enough. None of them are good enough. But when I went through that period of life where I wasn't reading and I wasn't in his word, I wasn't grounded, and I was not, I was really living a defeated life as a Christian. I was insecure, I was scared, I was fearful, I was full of doubt. I, all of those things. Once I dove into this, and not just read it to say I read it. Sometimes I can read a book and not even comprehend what I just read because my mind is thinking of something else. And I'm sure you probably do that at times too. So I'm saying when you read it, even if you just take one or two verses and you just read it and go back over it and look at all the words and say, what does this mean? How does, how does it apply to my life? What do I have to do to live up to it? You read it differently. Your life will change. The Holy Spirit will begin to work in you like never before. And one day, as years go by, as time goes by, you'll look back and say, I'm not the same person I was. You see, that insecure Wendy from years ago is now confident and secure in Jesus because I know who I am. I know who he's called me to, to be. It doesn't matter what anybody else says about me. It doesn't matter the ones that put me down. I know who I am. I'm a child of God. I'm loved. I'm set apart. I'm called. I have a purpose in my life. He has a plan for me. I know where I'm heading. I'm spending eternity with him. I have a boldness to share the good news with others. And all of that came because I continue to read his word. And it causes me to stand firm. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do? The Lord, I'm asking you that, but really the Holy Spirit is asking you that. What are you going to do? Every time, every day you get up and you turn the news on or you open up the app to social media or whatever else, you see all of the terrible things. And all of a sudden you start, you start doubting, how am I going to get through today? Oh, my goodness. Where is that money going to come from for this bill? Oh, my. Uh, I'm really hurting today. What my, man, is it that big C word? You know, I mean, we, we, our mind is filled every day with overwhelming thoughts of destruction. And that's from the enemy. That's from the enemy. If you read his word, you would know that he gives you life and he gives it more abundantly, right? You're not defeated. You're more than victorious through Christ Jesus. And you feel more prepared to go into battle, to stand firm against all of the tricks and schemes of the enemy. And you're not defeated. You know that Jesus is coming back. Praise God. But there's work to be done in the meantime. So as you stand this morning, and we sing... One more time to the Lord. I want you to take the time to talk to your Heavenly Father. To listen to your Heavenly Father. What He's saying to you right now. If He's convicting you, it's not me. If you're feeling guilty about not reading the Word of God or compromising in your beliefs and not standing firm, that's coming from the Holy Spirit, not me. I'm just the messenger. Right? He's saying... You need to make some adjustments and some changes. Ask him, what are those adjustments and changes that I need to make? Let him speak to you. 